So there you go. Oh boy. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the teasers. At, so I, I thought that was a good transition. Uh, yeah. Uh, very unfortunate uh, that we are facing what's going on with TSM and CLG right now, which is obviously going to be probably a large part of this show is the meta discussion about what's yeah. happening. Uh, CLG, the news dropped yesterday from uh, journalist of convenience, Travis Gafford. I've noticed that when it, when it's, when it's, when it's beneficial for him, he's a journalist and actually brings information. But when it's not beneficial for him, he claims he's a content creator and not a journalist. It's crazy how that works. Also, I will just throw this out there. Like one thing Travis never seemed to understand, even though he actually nailed it on the Danny Kit situation. I agree with Richard's position. Travis is correct. He's actually right that since he knows he has an obvious conflict of interest that he dated one of the main people accused of doing the things to Danny, it's actually totally correct to essentially recuse yourself and say, I will not speak on this topic at all. Now, by the way, that's better, by the way, guys, than if he'd have come out with some mealy mouth thing like, oh, sorry about all the people, like Captain Flag, sorry about all the people who got wrecked but you don't say the name. That's way more conspicuous. Also, if he'd have come out and said something, you know, it's not a big deal. It's, just, it's actually way better that he said nothing. The problem is this. It does also infer the following, which people don't want to have to think about, which is you're hardly totally neutral when it comes to CLG, TSM, right, Travis? You know, you were literally like blacklisted once from your livelihood by TSM. You literally used to be friends with all the people who ran CLG, literally personal friends, not wish you a double if Kelby, hot shot oh, yeah. back in the day. Like, you had to make it all so all I'll say is when you do leak stuff like that, look, it's all well and good if you're just leaking, like, I heard this. But, like, there's obvious disclaimers you got to put out there, mate. Like, there's, there's connect. You're not just some totally neutral observer. Hmm, what's going on with the CLG team? By the way, to start in on that topic, one thing I want to say at the outset is this. People are really uh, misunderstanding a, a key difference between CLG and TSM, and they're conflating the two issues, which is this. TSM is still Reginald to this day, is run yes. by Reginald. In fact, Riot even themselves essentially said in their investigation around it that one of the conditions of it was Reginald couldn't like interfere with the League of Legends team anymore. They've expressly like told you it's still Reggie. If you don't know, Hotshot hasn't been involved with CLG for many years. I don't know if he, yeah. I don't think he even owns any of it yeah. anymore, runs it right. So uh, I think as far as I know, that I... CLG is in, in some ways essentially CLG, the team you all remember, that died years ago, actually. Like now this is just the, the cops died now, you know. <laughs> yeah, but so guys, in case you didn't realize, uh, it's possible that some people still own minority stakes of CLG, but I doubt it um, because I, I think just based on the ownership. So they were bought out by Madison Square Garden, which is uh, Jim Dolan's company. And Jim Dolan. This is quite owns... a few years ago, right? This oh, what, like yeah. Four or I mean, five it was, years or it was 20. 16 2017 that, that, like that yeah. occurred yeah it was it was a long time ago um and the madison madison square garden company obviously owns madison square garden the the famous arena in new york city they also own the new york rangers nhl hockey team and they own the knicks which is yep. the nba team they probably own some other sports teams as well minor more minor sports teams but the point is is like they're very famous in new york jim dolan is a is a very famous um personality of dubious character I he's essentially say. considered like the if you know the nfl he's like the jerry jones of basketball fit most famously with the knicks like people think he interferes too much as an owner yeah and he does uh <laughs> and he does um so in any case like th when people were like we're talking about oh well the clg brand is you know no longer an endemic yep. org or this is such a tragedy it really just isn't no, like it exactly. really, you know, it, it hasn't been the CLG that I coached for or that Hotshot owned in in a long ass time, yep. guys, like six, seven years at this point. Um, and honestly, because the brand was handled so badly by Madison Square Garden, I mean, they didn't, you know, I thought I always thought it was weird that when they bought the company, they didn't actually make it a condition of the buyout to have Hotshot GG as like a mascot yep. or a whatever. Bit like when, if people team. remember when Astralis bought Origin, initially they wanted XPEC Evolve for that reason yeah. to sort of keep the branding consistent. Yeah. 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 So like I was really surprised that they didn't actually have a clause in there that would require Hotshot to be active um, and for them to, you know, pay him to do that, obviously, but he would get the enormous buyout as a result yep. of selling to Madison Square Garden. Um, that deal was brokered by a consulting. I didn't do it, uh, but that deal was brokered by a consulting firm that I was working for at the time called Catalyst. Um, so yeah, I was, I was, I was surprised. Um, and they, they really just haven't done much with the brand and they, they 
haven't really been active. I mean, they have some, they've, one of their keys has always been having the uh, CLG red, like female counter-strike team. Yep, that has been like true. a pillar of the organization. If we're to believe what Travis is saying, they may be cutting that. Um, Smash has been a game that they've been uh, pretty heavily invested in, but it's notoriously difficult to get uh, returns as a company on fighting game players and especially smash players and the reason why is because when you have all of these open brackets uh for fighting games you can't guarantee that your players are going to get significant airtime because they might just get knocked down in pools or something like that and even if that's not true uh sponsors will leverage that against you to pay oh, lower sure. um so even if you have the greatest player in the world is like 99.9 percent .9 likely to make top 16 or top eight um the sponsor will be like but what if they don't make top eight and then they'll they'll l lower those payments and especially in smash too because as you've seen uh nintendo is famously mer mercurial when it comes to esports and they basically just canceled the smash circuit this year all of a sudden so yeah i mean it, it is tough i think to be in in some of these games that they've been in and honestly, guys, because CLG was franchised immediately with the league, they would have paid at the time, for those of you who, who remember in 2017, if you were an existing LCS team, you paid $10 million yes, for the discount. LCS license. If you were not, and they brought you in, you paid 12. And then the $2 million difference was paid out to the other LCS teams who were not franchised. So they got a relative bargain. Now, we don't know the sales price because, uh, I mean, we've discussed this before on the show, when FlyQuest sold, um, there was no sales price associated with that. You'll notice, well, that's weird because we, in EU, we saw, you know, oh, it's like $35 million or whatever for 80% of the Misfits slot yep. and Misfits are retaining 20%. So all these numbers were made public. Um, and the, the the LEC slots were sold cheaper. I think they were sold for like $8 million or something like that. Uh, oh, because beginning, viewership, yes. Yeah, the viewership at the time wasn't as high in 2017. So they were discounted compared to LCS slots. Obviously, the reverse of that is now true. Um, so when it comes to these numbers, like first off, FlyQuest was bought by a, a private family, so they don't have to disclose anything. But I suspect, I mean, I know the number, but, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but I suspect that, uh, you know, if, if they were, if the LCS was proud of the fact that these slots had increased significantly in value to the same degree as LEC, it would be in the LCS's best interests to disclose that, oh, this slot also sold for more than an LEC slot or the same as an LEC slot. The reality is, is that LCS has decreased in value relative to the LEC, but it's still worth more than the $10 million they paid for it. So when you think about CLG trying to sell, um, Madison Square Garden and many other endemic sports owners, like traditional sports owners, who got into esports expected larger growth, larger returns, at least a path to sustainability at the moment, which hasn't happened. And some of them <laughs> are starting to consider leaving. And if you're Madison Square Garden, you know, maybe you could sell CLG hypothetically for like 20 to 25 million potentially. And you probably recoup, you recoup your initial fee. And you probably recoup a lot of the money, if not all of the money that you spent operating this team, because it's not like CLG has been splashing out for the oh, you know, seven million dollar yes. a year. Like they've been pretty smart about yep. getting value. So maybe they don't, they don't recoup all their money, but they probably recoup most of it um, and they exit and they don't have to run this thing anymore. Um, so to me, it seems like it is not that con CLG is not that concerning. It is a fully owned traditional sports entity that has decided that they no longer want to be involved in esports. And at the same time, we see one of these traditional sports entities exit. The owners of the Florida Panthers hockey team were the ones who just bought, bought FlyQuest and they're coming in and making an investment in the same space. So like one's coming in, one's leaving. I think, I think now traditional sports owners have a more sober vision of what esports is and like obviously it's it's much better known in the franchise era because we're we're now five years six almost six years into it um what the expected returns are and i think certain traditional sports team owners are going to see this as the original ones should have which is like okay maybe it's a loss leader for now but we're building up our brand and our expertise in the space because esports in 20 years is still going to be huge like it's going to be bigger than it is right now and i think 
the people who are coming in understand that and don't mind potentially losing a little bit of money now to generate brand equity later. And also the other advantage that the traditional sports owners have is that they usually have a lot more money because we're talking about, you know, most people who own traditional sports teams in the United States are like billionaires, right? And so in a world where a lot of these other teams, the endemic esports teams are having to take venture capital. And as we know, venture capital is very difficult to get as Thorne and I are currently experiencing ourselves with LFN. Um, they are having to run leaner, which means that the, the sports owners can kind of spend their way through a recession and actually increase their results, increase their fan bases, have better teams during this, this like esports winter that we're talking about. And it can make sense for them if they're planning on like a, 10 to 20 year timeline, right? Um, they can be very strategic during this era. It's the same thing that we might see ESL do now that they have all the, the money from the Saudi, Saudi Arabian government, which is that as everyone else is struggling, they can lose money now to grow a fan base and grow an audience um, and get an advantage in the future when the market perks up again. So that's kind of what we're dealing with uh, with uh, in, in the very broad and basic strokes uh, with what's going on in the esports scene right now. So you see it, TSM and CLG are very different because TSM is still that endemic team that's funded off of venture capital, and CLG is very much not. They were owned by a traditional uh, sports organization, and that organization wants to exit now, whereas TSM is trying to stay relevant in esports if we're to believe Reginald trying to buy a CSGO team uh, later this year in preparation for Counter-Strike 2. Um, and they have other businesses such as their technology and website businesses with the Blitz app and their website network, et cetera, et cetera. And they may spend, you know, bare minimum as it seems to operate the LCS team right now while searching for a potential buyer. Like the key thing for me as a difference is, as you say, essentially the people who own CLG are not people who are here because they love League of Legends and it's really important that the brand CLG be in League of Legends and succeed. They're people who were just business people who had an interest. Quite frankly, if you look who they are, it looks to me like, I think it's not even a coincidence they bought CLG guys. CLG famously won their first LCS title in Madison Square Garden in what was quite a famous sort of spectacle at the time for LCS. It was one of the big roadshow events they had as opposed to just being in the studio I've no doubt the Madison Square Garden people saw that and if you were someone like James Dolan you would think I want all the properties that would be around here so let me get a League of Legends team so one day when that becomes a sport like the NFL NHL NBA I've got my team already I could get why that would make sense the thing is now just like a lot of other people economically in hard times, you cut the things you care about the least. So that's why, for example, sponsorship budgets get cut. In this case, next rounds of venture capital don't go to certain teams. And so you might have seen in CSGO, people like Heroic openly saying they need money. That's like putting out the feelers, guys, like anyone would just need the money to continue. So I don't worry that much about the CLG one. The TSM one's the more disturbing one, because as you say, TSM is League of Legends and vice versa in North America. And the key thing for me is this, the people who bought CLG didn't ever go big. As you say, Monty, they had the LCS team because that was the legacy team. Even then, they ran it as a budget roster. And shout yep. out to some of the GMs over those years. They had a couple of lineups that were like third or fourth best in the region that had no business being with the lineups they had, the players they had. Sometimes they went all NA. Sometimes they took in like fallen stars that were down on their luck. They did a very good job over the years if you knew their budget yep. to actually stay relevant. So I, that's why it tricked people into thinking it was old CLG, even though it wasn't. But as you say... They were barely in CSGO. They mainly themselves, once CSGO got expensive, just flexed into the way the main ones that have the female angle. If you don't know, they had their female team way before anyone else did because they had people like Miss Harvey oh, yeah. or OG people behind the project. They had Potter and all those people. And then also, as you say, the only other games they really in were fighting games. And I'll give everyone the secret sauce on why these big orgs have fighting games. I learned this from my boss at SK many years ago. Here's what you do, Monty. If you have the budget to, and it makes sense, you buy in the best 
best players from the biggest games to be number one in esports. But if you can't do that, it actually, believe it or not, often makes more sense that instead of spending 80% of the budget to get the best team, but have the ninth best team in a big game, Monty, it actually makes more sense sometimes for marketing purposes to just get the best player in a small game. So for example, my boss at SK used to always have up his sleeve as an ace that even if the CSGO team or the League of Legends team didn't do well, or the Counter Strike 1.6 team, he could always flex into, I have the two best FIFA players in the world though. They are, you know, WCG gold medalists and world champions and, and he would always have that so that he could always go to his sponsor and say, SK Gaming houses world champions and it was a way to flex that angle. That's why people like CLG and when they were here, Echo Fox, if you notice the main area their best competitors were in the fighting games where it's one guy or two guys, you pay them way less than you pay esports people. Nowhere near the yeah, LCS yeah. salaries. Even the minimum LCS salary would probably be the best salary for a Smash player. That's how ridiculous that scene is. But th the point is, if that's your whole sort of like portfolio, like I've got an average as fuck LCS team, I've got a female CSGO team, so it's not even one that's like competing with all the bigger brands, and then I've got a bunch of Smash players, that means you were always running that on a budget. The problem I have is this. People are going to think because the results suck for TSM. TSM did the same thing. They didn't. The reason why this is very alarming for TSM is one, they have always bragged quite primarily it was fucking Lena doing it, but fair enough. They, they all did it as an org. They've always bragged that they're profitable. They even said after the FTX deal initially got a bit dodgy that there was no problem and everything was going to be fine and they were going to remain profitable and sustainable. All those like nightmare fucking terms that people throw out in esports when they don't even mean what they say at the time. Like, how do you remain sustainable without all the money you were promised, you moron? There's nothing to sustain. Do you even, it's even a concept in the game, you dickhead. That would be like, oh, I've got a sustain item. Oh, why is it not giving you health back, Reginald? Ah, oh, don't know, just need it though, don't I? Like, what are you talking about? Like, that's a term. That means something. So basically, if you look at Reginald's angle though, that is a fucking empire falling. That's the end of the, Ro the Roman Empire, Monty. That's just falling in gradually. Because think about this. People are going to think, if you look at the LCS placings, TSM's been on the downturn for years now. Yeah, but how? Remember, they were supposed to, after the double lift lineup that won, get another super team lineup with like double lift and fucking Jensen and Hooney was obviously Hooney did join it, but you know what I mean? It was, it was, sort of, it was gonna be it was gonna be like a super team if you don't know. Then consider this. Not only was double lift willing to come back, but then another angle that people don't miss but I can now reveal because now we know what happened. You know when we had that episode of the four horse milk, Peter Zhang and about all the bullshit he was doing where it seems like he was embezzling money. The darker element that I speculated at was think of this Monty, it's deeper than that. He wasn't just taking the money essentially that decided which player ended up joining the team because if the person yes. talking to him doesn't want to give him the cart they don't yep. get it well do you know what's crazy about that that a lot of this penny hasn't dropped for so many fans Monty go back now guys and look at the names that were rumoured he was talking to this motherfucker chose that bomb ass player over Bo Bo from Vitality was in that mix but I'm going to guess maybe he, his guy or his agent didn't want to give Peter Zhang the money so they didn't pick one of like the craziest import like fucking pieces of found treasure you'll ever find. They didn't pick him. They picked whoever Peter Zhang told him to do this guy because he was getting his fucking cut off. Or they'll kept speaking then or whatever the fuck it was. Whatever I angle they took. The point is, TSM hasn't gone super budget. They've, as far as I can tell, and if you know the Sword Art deal, they not only got Sword Art guys, they did such a bad deal with him, Team Liquid style for some reason, because I don't know why they do those. Like the Hans Summer one where you go, right, here's an enormous amount of money. Oh, you don't want to play anymore. Just keep it all. See ya. Like, Guys, how are you going to run a business this way? Is it any wonder eventually the hook, like the chickens had to come home to roost? Like it was always going to happen eventually. So to me, I don't buy even the angle, Monty, a team that hasn't given a fuck about Counter Strike since 2016. I'm supposed to believe now, no, no, it's all right. We're going to go into CS Go. Remember this detail, guys, because this is key. Remember a couple of years ago when Reginald made that stupid tweet saying he'll never let the team get like CLG. He meant in LCS. That's the only context he could have meant. And he said he would sell his car, his house. He did you can't then two or three years later go, I never really cared about league anyway. It's not a big deal in my business. I'm doing fine. I'm going to move into CSGO, a game I've actively ignored for six or seven years. Like the whole TSM thing to me is just so, it's like a house of cards and it's just falling down now, mate. I mean, I agree with what TSM is doing from a business perspective. That's the thing is like, it makes total sense, but also Reginald just straight up lied to his own fan base about what he was doing yep. and what his passion was and his willingness to potentially lose money. Uh, and it, the lies just kept coming. Like he lied about that, you know, sacrificing everything personally in order to keep this team online. 
Um, you know, it's just like shocking miss, you know, misspending of money, like spending six million dollars on an ultra washed sword art that like we knew was ultra washed. And then remember the reason why double lift wasn't on that roster was because Reginald was spitefully punishing yep. double lift because double lift, you know, committed then said, Oh, I'm not going to commit to being on TSM unless you get sword art. And Reginald was like, fuck you got sword art. And double Lift was like, can I be on the team? And Reginald said, no, fuck you. Like it was, it was spiteful from him. Yep. So that's the reason why that didn't happen. And then this is just, I do have to say Thor, and this is just, I tweeted this, this is so poetic, but isn't it absolutely incredible that TSM's League of Legends team was ultimately destroyed by one of their fans who turned out to be, I know this is, is really uncommon for TSM fans, a fraud and a liar. Because what happened, guys, is that Sam Bankman Freed was a giant League of Legends and TSM fan, and he came and he promised them $210 million over 10 years in order to sponsor the team. And what happened was, that money was a Ponzi scheme and Sam Bankman Freed is going to prison. And ultimately what's funny too, is that TSM lied about the, the FTX deal, not affecting their revenue or, and not affecting their plans. Like you can't tell me it, it, this is so absurd. You cannot tell me that you would be trying to sell the LCS slot if Sam Bankman Freed was not a fraud, if you were receiving $20 million a year and your sponsor cares about the League of Legends team. You would spend money on it because you have the money and that's what the sponsor wants to see. If you guys remember, it was a big deal when FTX came in because what happened was that TSM announced that their team was going to be called TSM FTX and they were going to have the sponsorship, particularly with the League of Legends team. Yep. And then Riot had to come out and say, no, you're not. Like they didn't even clear the sponsor with Riot at the time. And they said, no, you're not. You you cannot do this because we have markets where cryptocurrency can't be advertised. Like if they're broadcasting in China and you're calling the team TSM FTX, like that is against China, you know, Chinese and potentially other countries broadcast regulations. Whereas if LCS just has like the FTX gold graph, they can send a clean feed of the stream with a different overlay to a to a different country, right? So it allows them to control things. But they had to come out and say, no, you cannot be called TSM FTX, even though that is what TSM sold FTX, guys. That is what they sold them. So already there were problems within that relationship because TSM was not going to be able to deliver what they sold because it was not cleared with Riot in advance. Like they did a really bad job of that. And now that they don't have that money, there's no universe where we can believe that TS, what TSM said was true. That I, I look, man, I don't know a company of that size. Like, what's TSM's valuation? Four hundred million dollars or whatever. That's what they claim. Yeah, yeah, that's what they claim. But if you have a four hundred million dollar company and you suddenly lose two hundred million dollars of revenue over ten years, that I, I, just from a business perspective, that is an enormous blow to your company. And also, by the way, guys, that four hundred dollar, that four hundred million dollar valuation probably included that $20 million a year in revenue. It probably included that deal, which means their valuation has probably fallen pretty significantly from that point as well. So, you know, they were, they were abused by FTX, but at the same time, like given their shitty fan base, isn't it so perfect that one of their fans ultimately ended up destroying the the budget for the LCS team. And there's no other way to view this, guys. There's no, like, you cannot believe the constant lies that come out of TSM. See more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content? Well, subscribe to this channel then, or, you know, be a pleb and don't.